Well, the scripture this morning is an example of a truth that you and I know very, very well, uh, that good things can fall apart. Um, here we have a story as we continue through the book of Acts of, of this church was growing. We're in the thousands now. Um, the estimates are anywhere between 5,000 and 25,000. I know that's a big gap, but just many thousands of people are, are believers at this point. And these two groups of people are having legitimate problems with each other. Um, is it true that good things must end? It seems like this is the this is the beginning of oh no, this is how this is how it all starts to unravel. It's uh, two groups of people not getting along to each other with each other. Why does it often seem that way? That um, uh, what's the expression? Good things must come to an end. You heard that expression. It's very cynical. Maybe it's accurate in our experience that good things must come to an end. Why does it often seem that way? It's almost like it's a, like it's a law of nature that, uh, that uh, you know, th there's expressions um, like waiting for the other shoe to drop. That's good. It's not going to stay good long. Let's, well, it'll get bad soon. There's, um, there's some ideas about how we deal, speaking of laws of nature, th uh, deal with nature. There's a particular mentality that, um, the only thing wrong with nature is uh, the human presence. And if we removed humans and just let nature go on its own, it'll flourish and it'll be beautiful. Um, anyone who believes that probably hasn't had a garden in New Hampshire. Um, my garden does not tend towards order. It tends towards disorder. It tends towards weeds and rocks. Um, uh, I, beavers move into the brook. There's nature. And it's just flat and muddy and... Uh, nature tends towards disorder. And so it's no surprise that we find this in uh, human relationships as well. Things will tend towards disorder. Put two people in a room long enough together, they're going to get on each other's nerves. We have the whole COVID and lockdown as an experience and proof for all of that. We got on our family's nerves. They got on ours. Uh, it's no surprise that we find this. Um, there, we could also try to take this like hands-off approach in our relationships. Like, hey, I, I won't do any effort. We'll just, if it's good, it'll it'll just be good all the time until it's not good. And then, well, maybe that's just not the way it's supposed to be. Um, there's, uh, for me, that's kind of like uh, uh, um, easily identified in the saying, um, uh, loving, love is never having to say you're sorry. You heard that one? I'd like to use my favorite Greek word that I've used before, hogwash. Love is never having to say you're sorry. Please, that would be easy, right? That'd be great. Love is hard work. Love is having to say you're sorry a whole lot more, actually. It's, it's constantly uh, realizing that you need to be in right relationship and I'm the problem, it's me. Um, that was a Taylor Swift reference. I'm pretty proud of myself for that one, for all you Swifties out there. So what do we do then when disorder creeps in, whether it creeps into the garden or it creeps into our relationships? You might have the, the inclination to just run at it and say, stop, stop, stop the disorder, stop this. You've been on a long car ride with your kids. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Volume just builds and builds and builds and then you can't take it. Stop, be quiet. And then it calms down. But then what happens within a few minutes? It starts building and building again. It just, that's just the way it works. Everything still drifts towards chaos. Disorder doesn't just live in the world. It lives within each of us. It lives within all of us. And in a fallen world where humanity has, has broken ties with our maker, things always move towards disorder. All good things will come to an end. And so um, what if that was the end of the message? Hey, just want to let you know, all good things come to an end. Have a great Sunday. You probably wouldn't come back next week and I wouldn't blame you. Um, is there anything that we can do when we see disorder, when we find, uh, when we encounter friction in relationships, in the world, is there anything that we can do when that happens? The scripture this morning shows us that there is a way to undo disorder. And what we're going to see is that we undo disorder, not through passivity, but action, and not through control, 
but through service. And also what we end up seeing is that it's not in a singular hero, but in, in a plurality of empowered people. So again, the story uh, in Acts chapter six, the, the church is growing. Um, there, uh, it's, it's a lot of different people are coming and there's two main camps. There are the Jews, um, the Christians at this time, they hadn't, beyond, hadn't gone beyond the Jewish community. That's important to know. Um, it, the, the first Gentiles really haven't come into the Christian faith directly through Jesus. They've come first through Judaism and now into the Christian faith. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. We do believe that. Um, and so it's no wonder that these, these thousands and thousands of people are, uh, are in fact Jewish. But there's two different camps. There's Jews that have been living abroad for generations in Greek-speaking cultures and the ones who had been speaking or living in Aramaic or close to Hebrew-speaking cultures. And now these two are united under the same Messiah, but here's where the friction starts happening. Complaints start to surface from the Greek-speaking Jews that, hey, the Aramaic-speaking Jews are, are they're in charge of distributing all of the, the food to the widows, uh, 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 kind of a food bank. They're in charge of that, but they're forgetting the ones that speak Greek. They're forgetting our, our the widows in our community. Um, uh, they're, they're, it, this is an issue of, of care coming. You're not caring for us. There's some kind of uh, division happening. Um, I, I came across this quote and I thought it was interesting and I find it to be true that a, a church cannot grow beyond its capacity to care for its people. Um, it, th that is a that is a limit. So you can you can have a limited capacity to care for people. You can increase your capacity so that you can care for more people, but you won't be able to grow beyond your capacity to care for people. Uh, there was what was dividing these people. It was dividing. Uh, they were divided by culture. They were divided by even by language. Now, was this malicious intent? Did the did the Aramaic speaking Jews think the Greek speaking Jews were like less? Well, we don't have a lot of information on that, but just working cross culturally in different language scenarios, um, it's very easy to concern yourself with people who are like you, and it's very easy to forget the people who are not like you. So, at the very least, that's what's happening here. Uh, the Aramaic speaking Jews are just in their own social circles, and no one is taking any responsibility to look outside their own natural circles. So let's play a little game here about what these uh, people, these the 12 apostles could have done. Here they are, huge church. They are busy with all kinds of things. We've seen that through all, they recently got out of jail after being flogged. Like there's just a lot going on in their lives. Um, and uh, the complaint comes, hey, uh, our people aren't getting food and their people are. Hey, I didn't say this, you said this. And, and you can just imagine the kind of bickering that's happened. Um, if you, yeah, never mind. Uh, that, that you can expect that to happen with any type of group of people that come together. I was gonna make a joke about church business meeting, but ours here are really great. So I have nothing really to say about that. Um, but here's these complaints. Here's what the apostles uh, could have done. The first thing they could have done is, I think, ignore it and just said, you know what? We don't have the time to deal with this. It'll work itself out. Uh, let's leave it alone. They could have just like called everybody together and just like lambasted them. Hey, stop it. This is, you aren't being very Jesus-like. They weren't using the word Christian yet, but you aren't, you aren't being very Jesus-like. This is not the way you should all stop it. Or maybe they would have done something like that and just said, guys, let's just gather in a circle and sing Kumbaya until we feel good about each other again. Um, maybe the third thing they could have done is hey, maybe it's just better if we split up into two. You take care of yours. You take care of yours. We'll all be good. You have two sets of leaders, two benevolence budgets. We'll just keep it all separated and clean and won't that be easy. Or finally, these apostles could have said, you want something done? You got to do it yourself. And so they could have just jumped in and taken care of it themselves. They didn't do any of those things. And it's important to realize that they intentionally did not do any one of those things or any combination of those things. Let's look at what they did do, because I'm convinced that what they did is a lesson for us when we encounter any kind of disorder, any kind of, any kind of friction in relationships, whether that's family or friends or, or work, anything in the world and society. Let's look at what they did, because I think we can learn from this. First of all, they acknowledge the problem. 
They didn't sweep it under the rug. They didn't think it's going to take care of itself. They said, there is a problem. Let's look at, let's look at dead in the eye. There's a problem. They called all the people together and they said, look, this is a problem. We've heard it. Let's do something about it. The second thing is they kept the main thing, the main thing. This is pretty important because there's probably a whole lot of underlying issues uh, and, and elements that they just realized we're not going to be able to solve all this at once. There's just a whole lot of differences here. Um, let's let's take care of this one issue. Um, yeah, a little, just a little side note here. Um, if you think about how people change, sometimes we think that people change. Uh, by, we just need to we need to change our beliefs. Then then we'll, our behaviors will change automatically. My own experience working with this guy is that it's not just what I believe. Uh, but it, it, that will change my actions, but it's by creating good actions that I reinforce my belief. We call those habits. Um, by, by creating good habits, then I reinforce the belief because my own heart tends towards chaos and disorder. I want to do the things that aren't good for me, but if I have a, a set of beliefs or habits, then that reinforces the good in me. So anyway, they said, let's keep the main thing the main thing. What we need is a, is a way to behave with each other so that we can reinforce the belief that we really are one body. Um, uh, uh, we've got to find a pathway through this specific issue. We're not going to solve all the problems in the world right now. We have this specific issue. So they kept the main thing, the main thing. Uh, thirdly, they knew their own calling and their, limita and their limitations. They didn't say, guys, we got this. We'll figure this all out. Um, they knew their own calling and their limitations. Some of you need to say out loud to yourselves, I cannot do it all. Anybody feeling a little bit convicted? <laughs> I I am. I'm, I I can get. I'll do that. I'll do that. Anybody who's worked in the church with me knows that, that I'm. That, oh, I'll take care of it. I'll take care. Of it. I have that natural inclination. I can do it. These apostles they knew their calling and their limitations. We're not called to wait on tables, as some translations say, to run the food bank. I think is how the New Living Translation says it. We're called to the ministry of the word and to prayer. We know our calling. We know that our limitations are there. And so they, they uh, and they had practiced leaning on each other as disciples for over three years at this point. Uh, so they knew their calling and their limitations. And then finally, they found the way of servanthood. They found the way of servanthood, not of control. They didn't say, hey, we picked these people and we're going to, this is the plan and all that. They, they didn't go down into the details and said, here's the whole system. Here's how you're going to do it. I want you, 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 you. They said, look, we can't do this, but you all, you all pick seven people to, to do this. Uh, a good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. You choose them. We'll lay our hands on them and they're going to figure it out. They found the way of servanthood. They said, we serve in this way, choose seven to serve in this other way. And we will empower, will appoint, will release them to do it. This is really important. This is called servant leadership. It's servant leadership. It isn't authoritarian. Uh, there were clear lines of authority, but it wasn't authoritarian. They, they Together, they recognized, look, what brings us together is bigger than any one person or any one group of people. The cause is the biggest of all, that Jesus is Messiah. And this gospel has to go out to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the other parts of the earth, just like Jesus said. Like, this is the cause that we're all about. This is what we're united under. Let's not get hung up on these other things. We need to serve each other and find our way through this. We're in this together. So let's serve one another. Here's the big lesson. Any kind of disorder is undone by servant leadership. Any kind of friction in relationship, anything that isn't running smoothly, uh, I'm convinced, and you can bring me different scenarios afterwards, and we can test this hypothesis of mine with pretty good foundation, also in leadership studies. But and it's, servant leadership is the way to undo disorder. Is there a problem with a boss at work being unjust or, or being unfair or like putting restrictions that are just ridiculous? Are you going to get anywhere by saying, this is wrong? I, listen to me. You're dumb if you don't listen to me. You probably won't get very far if you say that. Uh, but is that the way to do it? Or is it to lead by serving, by getting in there and doing the best that you possibly can and just serving and just saying, okay, let's do this. Let's work with what we've got. Let's do this. Let me serve everybody around me. Friction in relationship between, I can tell you when I've been a jerk to Rebecca, 
what's what has broken my heart is her her serving attitude towards me, her 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 love towards me, her care towards me. That breaks down. That breaks down. The, I know they're few and far between. I'm not a. That was a joke. You guys don't believe me. I'm not a jerk by habit or practice. Okay. But when my heart tends towards disorder, and I say things that I regret, love is what breaks through. That's what servant leadership is. It's just loving, but it's taking an active role in loving. Servant leadership is the antidote to any kind of disorder or division. Here's what Jesus said about this uh, to his disciples. Jesus called them to himself, his disciples, and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, in this case, the Gentiles are the ones who do not know God. The, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over other people and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Studying the bar right there. It's interesting that the bar for waiting on tables was servant leadership. These, this was the only job in the beginning. One job, serve food equally to everybody who needs it. And the standard for that were people full of faith, the Holy Spirit and wisdom, a good reputation full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That was, that was the ingredients for, uh, for servant leadership. And what's the result? Let me read to you what happened as a result of this. It, growth had been stymied. Friction had occurred. They could not grow past this point. It had the potential to split them apart. They, they found the way of servant leadership. And verse seven, it says, and so because of this, the word of God spread and the disciples in Jerusalem uh, increased greatly in number. And even a large group of peace, priests became obedient to the faith. A large group of priests. The priests didn't believe that it was God at work till the people in the church got along. That, that was the miracle that the, that the pastors needed to see. They're getting along. How is this possible? That must be God. And then they came, they came to, I found that a lot more funny than you did. And that's quite okay. This is true in every area of your life, uh, you, with your spouse, with your kids, with your friends, with your colleagues, no matter what disorder you encounter, find the way of servant leadership. That is the way through. That is the way to break through everything that seems like it's out of order and to bring peace and order to it. Just like Jesus did. So again, how do we do it? We acknowledge the problem. We keep the main thing, the main thing. We know our calling and limitations. And finally, we find the way of serving. Let me pray. Lord, this morning, this message is perhaps more of a, a practical lesson but it certainly reveals something to us about you, about how you work. Jesus, you showed us the way of servanthood. What, what greater love has this than a person would lay down their life for another? I, I picture you, Jesus, the, the night when you were betrayed before you went to the cross wrapping a towel around your waist and washing the disciples speak. You serve. And that's how you led us through the disorder in our relationship with God. You saved us by laying yourself down. Lord, help us to follow you in that. Help us to lay ourselves down for the sake of your work in other people's lives, for the sake of loving others. For the sake of your name being glorified, teach us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.